Sure enough, uh, since March 2nd, we've been in this season of Lent, contemplating the meaning of the cross. In particular, its meaning for forgiveness. And like like, uh, Pastor Aaron said, forgiveness in so many realms. But today, looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing, looking back, somebody that can actually be pretty hard to forgive. Maybe the hardest of all. We heard from the letter from Peter in 1 Peter, uh, which Mike read from, and I'm going to revisit a couple verses from that. We're also going to look at Paul's letter to the Romans. If you have a Bible with you in some form, we're in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And as you get there, I want to open with a story about a man that I heard about recently named Josh Galarsa. This is a story about someone who had to learn to forgive himself, but a bit of a curvy road to get there. Life had dealt Josh a difficult hand, namely during his teenage years, in the form of his mother's live-in boyfriend. Josh never names this man. The man was emotionally abusive and threatening, prompting Josh to barricade his bedroom door at night and sleep with a screwdriver next to his bed just in case he needed protection. Think about the anxiety. Josh's relationship with this man worsened to the point of police intervention. And at the young age of 15, Josh found himself forced to move 2,000 miles away from his mom. From that distance, Josh's worst nightmare came true. The man threatened Josh's mom with a knife. He heard about it from across the country. Josh shared that after that, for over a year... Every moment of his young life was consumed by rage-filled thoughts of revenge. And he even prayed, he says, for this man to die. So every Wednesday, for over a year, he would call his mom, hoping that everything was all right. He would call to see if she was okay. Until one day, she called him. And it wasn't a Wednesday, so he knew something was up. She called to let him know that the man who had caused him so much pain had just died. But he had taken his own life. And then she explained to Josh that he had recently been taken to a mental institution where they discovered he had had a brain tumor all along that caused him to be bipolar. Josh said, quote, I had been battling the pain he caused me all while he was battling a mental illness. Now what I admired so much about Josh's story, and his story goes on to a a place of healing. What I admired about him was his willingness to confess that in his heart he had already condemned this man. Maybe you can relate. I can. Excuse me. And even though the man's mental illness does not excuse his actions, when Josh got that call from his mom and his perspective broadened, the condemnation he had focused on the man now turned toward himself and became the crushing weight of guilt. Josh was feeling the truth of what Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, if you commit murder, you're subject to judgment, but I say, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Josh was feeling that weight. He would need to find a way to forgive his mom's boyfriend, even post-mortem. Maybe to forgive his mom. Maybe others. But Josh confessed in his talk that he would definitely need to find a way to forgive himself. It's complicated stuff. Forgiveness. But let's listen to Paul's uh, message in Romans. Chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Let's listen for the Word of God. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Moving on to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. (laughs) 
Why do you suppose Paul had to write this, these words? Remember, good Bible students, the Bible wasn't written out of nowhere. He's writing for a reason. Why do you think Jesus had to so famously teach, do not judge or you too will be judged? Why? Well, it is, of course, because having been made in God's image, we are constantly tempted to sit in God's seat, the judgment seat. What's interesting is that our secular humanist culture, the culture we all live in, has spent incalculable amounts of energy discouraging the judgment of others. And probably rightly so. It's everywhere. You guys nod some heads if you know what I'm talking about. The idea of being judgmental is absolutely anathema in the culture around us. Even to the degree of sort of dictating what words and phrases we should and should not use just in case. We come across judgmental. So the culture we're in is extremely sensitive to being judgmental of others, agreed? Except for one person. There's one person that the culture not only allows you to judge, it encourages you to judge. Who's that? Yeah. But wait, I'm confused. How is it that I'm not qualified to judge anyone but I am qualified to judge myself. How does that work? What's interesting about it, I think, is that the secular humanist culture is double-minded. It says somehow I can be the judge and jury over myself. The problem is we all judge differently. Outside of civic law, so there's laws, right? But outside of civic law, there's no standard for whether or not you're a good person or I'm a good person. We're all over the map about that stuff. Somebody will commit terrible wrongs and see themselves as innocent. Another person will just make honest mistakes and carry around a huge burden of guilt. The self is no standard by which to assess the world. When we condemn another person whom Jesus is willing to forgive, we make a mockery of the cross. But what about when we insist on being our own judge? What does the cross mean then? For the next several minutes, I'm going to outline a few principles about self-forgiveness. And then we're going to move into the good news of Jesus and how it interacts with those principles. And hopefully it becomes clear that we can indeed choose to forgive ourselves. I think Jesus is hollering out for us to be free. And we can forgive ourselves when we accept God's forgiveness. Self-forgiveness is complicated, and I am no expert, so I'm relying on the work of Professor Peg O'Connor, who skillfully explains two basic reasons we fail to forgive ourselves. Maybe you'll recognize yourself in a little bit of what you're about to hear. First, we fail to forgive ourselves when we don't think we need to be forgiven. It's kind of what we were talking about with the kids, right? A couple of ways we do this, we minimize our role, right? I, I didn't, I wasn't even hardly there. I didn't even say anything. I was there, but I barely, what? I, hmm? When I was in sixth grade, I went to UP Primary, which was UPE at the time. Yeah, woo woo, yep. <laughs> Go on, Mustang. Um, <laughs> and I was uh, sitting out in the field at recess, and there was a bunch of kids throwing rocks over the fence out into the street. I didn't throw a rock. I, I'm in church. I remember this. I was like, what? And guess who went to the principal's office? All of us. So there we are sitting in the principal's office, Mrs. McGrath. I was like, Mrs. McGrath, I didn't even touch a rock. It didn't matter. I got in trouble anyway, right? I minimized my role. We also shift blame, right? That's been happening since the Garden of Eden. You know, she did it. The snake did it. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't me. There was a whole song about it. It wasn't me. I knew this was the room for that joke. <laughs> Finally, we also revise our history, right? Wait a second. That's not what happened. No, no, that's not what was said. I re no, we revise history, right? Even if we mean to best, we still do it. When we do these things, we may walk away feeling like resolution has happened. We may walk away feeling like we're clean. But Dr. O'Connor says no. She says, quote, this is not genuine self-forgiveness because there's little self-reflection about how our actions have harmed others or ourselves. you got to do the work. So we don't forgive ourselves when we don't think we need to, but that doesn't mean we're not guilty. 
And it doesn't mean we don't feel guilty. It's just that we've stuffed it down so far that, you know, 35 years later, you're talking about going to the principal's office when you're in sixth grade. <laughs> the second reason we don't forgive ourselves, maybe more familiar, is when we don't think we deserve to forgive ourselves or we don't feel worth it. A few ways that she outlines. One, perfectionism. In a word, when we hold ourselves to a higher standard than we hold anyone else to, and usually a standard that is absolutely impossible to reach. It's like trying to pole vault over a hundred foot bar every time walking away going, I'm terrible at pole vaulting. It's a hundred feet high. You're never going to get over that. That's perfectionism in a nutshell, right? It's terrible. It's poison. That's one. Another one, this one was new to me, expansionism, she calls it. This one's fascinating in the age of the internet. Expansionism is how we feel guilty when we believe our sphere of responsibility is way, way bigger than it really is. So some congressperson in some random state that I've never even set foot in says something I don't like. And then I have this burden on me to like, do I change my profile picture now? Do I post something? If I don't post, am I complicit? <sighs> And I carry around the burden of guilt for some random congressperson in a place I've never even been. Is that realistic? No. That's expansionism. But I feel guilty about it anyway. Finally, confirmation bias. When I already think I'm a jerk, a loser, no good, then everything that happens just serves to confirm that, right? Even if I succeed, I go, yeah, but it could have been better. If somebody's angry with me, I go, yeah, it's because I'm a loser. We confirm our bias. When we do these things, O'Connor writes, we never come to resolution because it feels like our penance is never paid. It's a very terrifying way to live. So in a little bit, we're going to look at getting beyond these two tendencies and using three steps towards self-forgiveness. We heard it in the little chant with the kids. But first, let's turn to the Bible and see what Peter and Paul are saying and how it relates to these two tendencies. First, that reason we fail to forgive ourselves when we don't think we need it. The Apostle Peter uh, has some pretty compelling words. Listen to verses 6 and 7 again. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 reads, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I'm curious to know who of you have heard the cast all your anxieties on him verse before. Can I see a show of hands? Yeah, a few of us. Graduation cards, something hanging in the bathroom, whatever, right? They're, it's out there. And that's great. That's great. I don't mean to be flippant about that. That's a, it's a very important concept. Cast your anxieties on the Lord. Look at the context, though, just for a moment. Cast your anxiety on him after you humble yourself. Look at the context in the, of guilt and forgiveness. What's the relationship between being humble and casting our anxieties on the Lord. If you live very long, you'll inevitably hurt someone. That's a hard truth to accept, but it's true. If you're in relationship with anyone. And when we're confronted with the fact that we can be hurtful, our natural reaction is often defensive. We get defensive to the person we hurt. We also, though, get defensive in our own heart. Because I don't want to face the fact that I can hurt someone. I'm a good person. I don't like it. So I protect myself from it. By those defense mechanisms, right? It's not just pride. It's scary to think about how we might be hurtful of someone else. So we protect ourselves by trying to control the situation and reframe it using all the tricks that Dr. O'Connor explained earlier. Maybe the most familiar example from Western literature is Ebenezer Scrooge. That's right. Scrooge reference in April. The famous cheapskate <clears throat> who would rather shiver than spend a few dollars lighting the fire, right? But Scrooge's miserliness is rooted in his deep guilt, if you know the story. He could never live up to his father's expectations, guilt. He put his career before the love of his life, guilt. He was cruel to his community, guilt. He alienated his only family, guilt. He's riddled with guilt. So much so that his friend Jacob Marley comes back in the form of a ghost and lets him know... His chain is miles long. That's how the story starts. You, Scrooge, are guilty. And Scrooge pulls out all the tricks 
Ah, you're just a blot of mustard. Pff, I'm just doing my job. Right? You recognize all the tricks? Pulls them out. And so later when he is humbled by the spirits of Christmas, and he comes to face the truth. So to avoid Scrooge's mistake, to be able to forgive ourselves, come to peace about the ways we have been harmful, we have to take the anxiety about being guilty and put that before the foot of the cross. Not just any anxiety, although we can bring any anxiety to God. But in this case, in this scripture, bring to God the anxieties that make us arrogant. The anxieties that lead to hubris. Bring those anxieties and face the truth. It's okay. His mighty hand won't crush you. His mighty hand will hold you, lift you up when you're ready. Scrooge, of course, was eventually forced to do this. I uh, wish that was always the case. I'd love to have some spirits come visit me at night and fix everything. Uh, but when he did, he was able to reach reconciliation and peace within himself. Even in this scene right here, uh, he's actually saying, God, forgive me for the time I've wasted. He's coming to terms with the truth. So when we do that, then we're able to release that anxiety and find a way towards forgiveness of ourselves. Now, the second reason we fail to forgive ourselves is because we don't feel like we deserve it, right? And that's where Paul's words in Romans 8 are so powerful. They're what we need to hear. So again, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't it funny that even though nobody likes to feel guilty, everybody does? I think that's weird. That makes me go, hmm. Nobody likes it. Everybody kind of understands how to get over it, right, through reconciliation. But somehow, the demon of guilt always hangs on. We may feel guilty for things we never actually did wrong. We may feel guilty regardless of how much we've done to make amends. We may feel guilty for lost time that we have no idea how to grieve. <laughs> we may feel guilty just because of who we are. And some voice in our head has told us that we're not enough. That's guilty feeling too. And we may not even realize that we're feeding that undeserved guilt with all those mental habits like perfectionism and expansionism. We may not even realize it. We just wonder why, why we feel so terrible about ourselves. Sometimes the line between guilt and non-guilt can actually be pretty blurry. You might remember the movie Good Will Hunting. Will is in mandatory therapy because he is absolutely guilty of assaulting someone. He's gotten a fist fight. But over the course of his therapy, he eventually confronts the painful memories of having been abused by his foster father. And in this famous scene, his therapist tells him, it's not your fault. Know the scene? And Will goes, yeah, I know. His therapist says, no, you don't know. It's not your fault. And he has to repeat it over and over until finally it gets through to him. Until finally he's, he's ready to receive that. Go from here to here. And he's free. Finally free. When we're plagued with this kind of guilt, Paul's words are scandalously simple. There is no condemnation in Christ. Don't think you spend enough time with your kids, but you're trying as hard as you can. There's no condemnation in Christ. Struggling in your marriage, but you're trying everything you can think of. There's no condemnation in Christ. Somebody at work that, that you insulted. An in-law that you've never really enjoyed. But you try. You do your best even though your reach is only actually this wide, and even though there's only 24 hours in the day, there's no condemnation in Christ. When you feel that voice condemning you for being a bad son, daughter, being a bad spouse, being a bad in-law, being a bad parent, or whatever, that voice does not come from the Lord, folks. That voice needs to be talked back to you. Remember battle plan? We talk back to that voice with this scripture. There is no condemnation 
in Christ. Maybe we should repeat that to ourselves the way Will's therapist repeated it to him until we actually believe it. And we might just feel like we're trying to let ourselves off the hook. But Paul does explain how this is possible. He says, so God condemned sin in the flesh. Turns out there is condemnation in Christ. Oops. Just not of you. But there is condemnation of what? Of sin. That's what gets nailed to the cross in Jesus. Why? Because he loves you and me and he wants us to be free. That's the truth. That is what the voice of the Lord says to us. So when we hear from Peter and Paul and we face the difficulty of forgiving ourselves, it all starts with humbly accepting the truth, whether it's the truth of our, of our actual guilt or the truth of our undeserved guilt. Either way, we face that truth humbly and we know that it is through Christ Jesus we're given mercy. In him there's forgiveness. And you don't have to feel it before you say yes to following him. I don't know anybody who ever has, actually, including in the Bible. He calls us first. <clears throat> we say yes first, and then he begins to untangle all this stuff by his grace. So rather than avoiding or languishing in our guilt, forgiving ourselves begins with that truth. And then those three steps, admit, repair, commit. This is the practical application. If you're a practical application person, take some notes. Admit, <clears throat> repair, commit. We have to admit that by chance or by choice we can hurt people. When and how can we admit it? Well, any time that it comes up. But also, regular worship attendance is, partly, is important for a lot of reasons, and this is one of them. Because regular worship attendance gives us a chance to admit the truth before God. Every week through prayers of confession, through music, every month through the Lord's Supper, and especially once a year in this very week, Holy Week. We can release control and get out of the judgment seat, even over ourselves. And let God have the control. Let God tell us who we are. Let God define us and give us our identity in Christ. We can live beyond our feelings. Not ignore our feelings, but live beyond our feelings. Don't get stuck in feelings only. Because feelings come and go. But the love of God remains always. And as we truthfully come to an admission of what's What's, uh, of what's happening in us, we can then start to pursue repair. The Bible doesn't just teach us to forgive, uh, receive forgiveness internally, even of ourselves. We have to start seeking healing. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I was able to uh, meet a couple of people totally independently of each other, kind of a holy coincidence. Both of these men told me that they had received a DUI recently, driving under the influence, right? They explained how t scary and humiliating it was to spend a night in jail. How painful it was to face their friends and family. But they both also wholeheartedly shared that they were glad they had been given a DUI. Imagine. They were glad they'd been given a DUI. Why? It forced them to admit the truth. Can't hide now. And then they had to start seeking tangible reparations with the law with their friends and family and community, right? They were glad for it. That's what repair can look like. Mending things as best we can. Don't have to be perfect, but we do have to try. The Bible insists on that kind of accountability, reconciling with others and within our own hearts. So the question we all have to ask ourselves, if I'm going to forgive myself, what does repair look like in that process for me? And at admitting, seeking repair, finally, there's always the commitment. There's always the commitment Two different ways we commit. One, we have to remember. If you've ever really come to reconciliation, there's the beautiful euphoria that follows. You feel free. It's finally over. Until two weeks later when the demon comes back to let you know maybe you're not so free after all. So commitment looks like remembering the truth. There is no condemnation in Christ. I've admitted the truth. I've sought reparations. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm forgiven. And two, repentance. Oh boy, that's a tough word to say from, from a pulpit, right? Uh, because it always sounds so like, Brr, repent. Repentance isn't really an action as much as a lifestyle. Repentance is the daily discipline of saying yes to what God wants and no to what the world is, is trying to draw me away to. Repentance is a healthy habit 
like eating well, for example, like exercise. It's good for us. Repentance is not about beating ourselves up with more guilt. No, it's about the opposite of that. It's about releasing guilt. Repentance doesn't mean perfection. That's why we do it every day. And repentance definitely doesn't mean, act, mean acting morally superior. It's the daily discipline, the healthy habit of saying yes to God. That's what repentance is. And that's part of that commitment as well. So we admit, we repair, we commit. And thereby, we know we can forgive ourselves. Paul proclaims it. Peter proclaims it. God will lift us up with his mighty hand. So if you're carrying around the heavy burden of guilt, I hope something in this is speaking to you. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. That you're starting to see a door open to forgiveness of yourself that can actually set you free. It's never too late. And you are worth it. You're worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your grace is sufficient for us. And your hand is mighty. It's so mighty it can be scary. So scary we don't want to admit the truth sometimes. So scary we can't imagine that you're willing to give us grace and mercy. But you are. And thank you for your word and the assurance you give us today through your word. May you uh, come into the hearts and minds of everyone who's hearing this today or, or after today. <clears throat> but lead them to you. If you want them to be free in you, may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.